This conference marks the 50th anniversary of a book that Time Magazine once listed as one of the 10 most important books of the century, The Other America by Michael Harrington of the class of 47. I've wondered if, uh, how much time Harrington spent here in Silos. I know he certainly spent time uh, upstairs eating every day in uh, Kimball Dining Hall. The conference is divided into two sections. Today we'll look at The Other America, the book, and the context of it in the 1960s and the Great Society. Tomorrow we'll ask the question, if a new book, The Other America, were being written today, what would one need to write about? It's often said that Michael Harrington helped Americans discover poverty. He emphasized the degree to which huge numbers of Americans were invisible to middle class Americans. Students should look back on that claim and find it a bit odd, on the one hand, that anyone could have needed a writer to point out that poverty was plentiful in America. Could intellectuals and middle class Americans have been so out of touch that they needed to be reminded that poverty was such a big part of American society? Odd as it may seem to think that poverty needed to be discovered, I'm still struck at how often young people, raised by parents who want them to avoid contact with life's hard edges, are startled and changed when they are brought into direct contact with the poor. The poor, like Native Americans 400 years ago, were not sitting around waiting to be discovered. But the situation of the poor does need renewed attention and focus. What Harrington did was to help bring them to the attention of the middle and upper middle classes, and he's part of a long tradition of writers who have tried to do that at least since the 19th century. It's clear that Harrington hit a chord. He stirred the consciousness of a country when, whose cultural critics were more worried that Americans were becoming too affluent for their own good. It should be no less remarkable today that we would need to draw attention to poverty in America. But it's clear to me that the poor need to be discovered again today in our own political and public discourse. There's rising attention to inequality today, but is inevitably focused on the middle class and the notion that ostensibly more virtuous, hardworking people might be pulled down to be among those poor. Americans are starting to become more aware that income mobility in the US lacks behind Canada and much of, East, of, of, of Europe. Yet the story that dominates the media now is the story about the fragility of the middle class's access to the American dream and the possibility that they might lose their status. But I think I'm getting ahead to tomorrow's discussion. Michael Harrington did help others discover poverty in their midst. As I've talked to scholars about the conference and others, particularly those of a generation who came of age in the 60s and 70s, I've been struck to hear how often they cite The Other, American, the Other America as a book that changed them. I've heard about retiring faculty who, cleaning out their offices, see it as a book that they still must save. I have my enthusiasms and my reservations about the book, but I do want to hold it up to students as a lesson that a book can help change the world, or at least help millions of people see the world differently and change the way governments and institutions act. I look forward to exploring that with you, how that happened some 50 years ago. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Holy Cross and to Silos Theater. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome our first speaker today, Morris Isserman. Um, before I even talk about his lengthy CV, which I'm not going to because this is a conference on Michael Harrington and social justice, so we're not going to get caught up in all of those things, I just want to say how much his work as an historian of America, of, of America has had a major impact on interpretations of the left, new and old, um, from the mid-century forward for a lot of young historians. Um, he's currently the Publius Virgilius Rogers, professor of history at Hamilton College, and has held the distinguished chair from the Fulbrights um, in American history at Moscow State University in Russia, as well as a year-long Mellon Fellowship at Harvard. His CV is too long to enumerate here. He's the a scholar of 20th century American history. He is a public intellectual who's written articles and editorials. Um, probably his no most noted books, I would say. I mean, how do you do this? How do you pick? Um, his most noted books, his first was, which, which side were you on, the American Communist Party during the Second World War, and if I had a hammer, the death of the old left and the birth of the new left, which is still taught regularly in different courses. Uh, he was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize for his book that he co-authored with Michael Kazin, who's going to be speaking here tomorrow. Um, on America Divided, the Civil War of the 1960s. And of course, we're here today because of his work on Michael Harrington, which he'll speak about in a minute. 
But lesser known, he's written books on mountaineering and on Hamilton College, and perhaps one of my, my favorite aspects of this public intellectual life of Morris Isserman is, is works for, sec for um, younger readers, secondary school, school books and the like. So I think it's fantastic. I'm glad there are students here. I know that um, it's important to me as a faculty member at the College of the Holy Cross that the legacy of Michael Harrington be something that we remember. Subsequent alums sometimes overshadow that legacy. You know, new people graduate, new people gain celebrity. And I think it's incredibly important, given our mission and what we do here, that we take time to remember this person and perhaps in part his formation here and certainly his impact on the larger culture. So it is with that that I welcome Morris Isserman to start us off for the conference. Thank you, Stephanie, for the generous introduction. And thank you, Tom, for all the work you did in organizing this. The title, Publius Virgilius Rogers, is a, refers to a wealthy 19th century Hamilton College alum. And my predecessor put me in my place when I, with that title, put me in my place when he said his kids used to call him the poopiness ridiculous professor. <laughs> so you make your choice. When Michael Harrington's The Other America, Poverty in the United States first appeared in March of 1962, Mike had uh, modest ambitions for it, expecting to sell a few thousand copies. Instead, it proved a publishing phenomenon, garnering substantial sales, wide and respectful critical attention, and a significant influence over the direction of social welfare policy in the US during the decade that followed. By February 64, Business Week noted that The Other America is already regarded as a classic work on poverty. And Time Magazine, as Tom mentioned, listed it as one of the 10 most influential books of the 20th century, along with Freud's Civilization and its Discontents and Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Uh, it's a particularly appropriate, this is the first 50th anniversary event marking the publication of the book, um, because of the importance this institution held in Mike's intellectual development and his lifelong affections for it. And for me, because my uh, uh, research began here in 1990 when I was teaching down the road at Williams College and I came here um, to begin uh, researching the book uh, on Harrington that came out in 2000. When I started my research, I think I had a pretty good grasp of Harrington the Socialist, having interviewed him in the early 1980s for a book I was writing about the history of the American left. But I was on shakier ground when it came to appreciating the importance of his pre-socialist experience, born and raised as a devout Catholic, and taking his first steps into political activism as a member of the Catholic worker movement. I made my lack of information on Mike's Catholicism abundantly clear on my first day in the archives when I was going through his college transcripts. He was here from 1944 to 1947, graduating in three years because of the accelerated wartime schedule. It was World War II when he began as a student here. And I looked up from the transcript uh, and in all sincerity asked the um, archivist, why do all of Mike's teachers have the letters SJ after their <laughs> names? Uh, Brandeis students talk to me afterwards, I'll explain why that's funny. <laughs> the archivist uh, was good enough not to laugh and thus began my education in the uh, history of Catholicism in general and Catholic higher education in particular. So as penance for past sins, I'm going to begin my comments with a discussion of Mike the Catholic uh, before turning to Mike the Socialist. And here is Michael Harrington uh, in 1947 at Holy Cross. Um, and uh, it's his senior year, he's 19. Uh, and this was a picture of him that appeared in the Purple Patch, which was then the name, may still be the name of the Holy Cross literary magazine. Mike was born on February 24th, 1928 in St. Louis, the only child of loving and moderately prosperous parents of sturdy Irish Catholic lineage, baptized three weeks later at St. Rock's Church, which is named for a 14th century French aristocrat who at the age of 20 gave away all his possessions to the poor and cared for the victims of the plague. Mike began his Catholic education at the age of four in the local parish kindergarten, continuing in the parish school through third grade before transferring to a boys' school run by the Marianist Order in St. Louis. And in 1940, at the precocious, precocious age of 12, skipping eighth grade and transferring to the Jesuit-run St. Louis University High School, where he was enrolled in the elite classical course, four years of Latin, two years of Greek, along with philosophy, theology, literature, and the arts. 
in a curriculum that hadn't changed much since the Jesuits first adopted it in 1599. The most important benefit of a Jesuit education, the St. Louis University High School School Yearbook proclaimed in 1942 was that it instilled, quote, the necessary fortitude and enthusiasm to step forth in battlefield, college, or workaday world and strive toward the urgent conversion of a perverted pagan universe, end quote. <laughs> that sounds rather grim and daunting. But the reality was that uh, St. Louis University High School for Mike was a joyous period of intellectual flowering. He shone academically, undertook his first ventures in journalism as sports editor of the school newspaper, and was a star of the school's highly competitive debate club. Bill Loftus, who was a classmate of Mike's at both St. Louis University High School and at Holy Cross, told me in an interview, many a time in high school I saw Mike win a debate by standing there with his open Irish face, blinking at the judges, quoting brilliantly from a purely fictitious authority to prove his point. In one debate, he even had the nerve to quote from Dr. Dingbat Fu, and they bought it. He was very, very good. And of course, he remained a good debater and uh, public speaker throughout his life. Mike graduated from high school at the age of 16 in 1944, and his parents told him he could go to any college in the country as long as it was Catholic. He chose Holy Cross. The rigors of his high school education continued and intensified at the cross. In those pre-John the 23rd philosophy and religion classes, Mike recalled in one of his memoirs, when you were asked to prove the existence of God, the professor was not soliciting your opinion on the subject. <laughs> Students were tightly supervised. They were not permitted to leave the hill for a stroll downtown except on Saturday evenings. And if they missed two of the six morning masses required every week, that privilege was withdrawn. Seating was assigned at meals and in class, and students were required to wear jackets and ties for mass, class, and meals. Mike once again thrived academically and in the extracurriculars, editorial page editor for the newspaper, managing editor of the literary magazine, president of the debating society, which bested Clark and Worcester Tech, to bring home the City Debating Championship Cup in 1947. He was salutatarian of that class of 47, again graduating in three years. He also became a Republican, much to the horror of his staunchly Democratic parents, although that act of youthful rebellion proved short-lived. <laughs> Mike was, as I mentioned, the editorial page editor. and the, the, the editorials in the school newspaper then called the Tomahawk, perhaps still so-called, uh, were unsigned, but one appeared in the spring of 1947 that, to my ear, sounds a good deal like the later Michael Harrington, particularly in its love of paradox, a rhetorical trick that he picked up from a, a close reading of G.K. Chesterton's essays. Uh, the editorial had the suggestive title, For the Radicals, and argued that the defense of traditional values in modern society was the true radicalism of the age. For he is a radical, this is Mike or whoever was writing this, for he is a radical who argues against divorce. He is a dissenter who argues against birth control. And the man who has the effrontery to claim that he believes what he does not see is a rarity in this world of materialism. Stayed, unchanging, a rock in the swirling ocean of conflicting ideas, the Catholic Church stands out as the last stronghold of the radical, a system which is 2,000 years old uh, is the only radical in a world of conformists. Mike's Catholic education did not make him either a conservative or a radical. His ideas would change dramatically. What he did gain was a sense of moral gravity, which would stand him in good stead as he emerged as a social critic and political dissenter. I grew up in the Catholic Church, he would recall in his memoirs, and from the time I was a little kid, the church said your life was not something you are to fritter away, your life is in trust to something more important than yourself. And in a later book, The Politics at God's Funeral, he would write that socially committed, quote, believers and unbelievers have the same enemy, the humdrum nihilism of everyday life in much of Western society, which again kind of echoes that, that 1947 um, uh, editorial in the Tomahawk. From Holy Cross, he went to Yale Law School, excelled, dropped out after a year, followed by graduate studies in literature at the University of Chicago, excelled, dropped out after a year, 
and then moved to New York's Greenwich Village to become a writer, in the process of which he read and reasoned his way out of and back into the Catholic Church several times. He was looking for something, thought he found it when he joined Dorothy Day's Catholic Worker Movement in 1951, but by 1952, he was out of the worker and the church and became a member of the Young People's Socialist League. He had found his path. Which brings us back to this book in a 1960s uh, paperback edition, which is the uh, edition that I first encountered in 1966. The Other America was a short work, 186 pages in the original edition, with a simple thesis. Poverty in the affluent society of the United States was both more extensive and more tenacious than most Americans assumed. The extent of poverty could be calculated by counting the number of American households who survived on an annual income of less than $3,000 and adjusted now to about uh, $22,000. These figures were readily available in the census data, but until Harrington published The Other America, they were rarely considered. Harrington revealed to his readers that an invisible land of the poor, over 40 million strong, or one in four Americans at the time, fell below the poverty line. For the most part, this other America existed in rural isolation and in crowded slums where middle-class visitors seldom ventured. That the poor are invisible, he wrote, is one of the most important things about them. They are not simply neglected and forgotten, as in the old rhetoric of reform. What is much worse, they are not seen. To explain the tenacity of poverty, Harrington borrowed the notion of the culture of poverty from the anthropologist Oscar Lewis. Lewis, whose ethnographic study of Mexican slum dwellers, Five Families, Mexican Case Studies in the Culture of Poverty, was published in 1959. He contended that being poor was not simply a condition marked by the absence of wealth or adequate income. Rather, poverty created a subculture of its own. However different their places of origin, Lewis argued, poor people in Mexico might have more in common in terms of family structure, interpersonal relations, value systems, and so forth with their counterparts in Puerto Rico or New York City than with other better off people from their own countries. Echoing Lewis, Harrington argued that American poverty constituted a, quote, separate culture, another nation with its own way of life. Poor Americans were not distinguished from their affluent counterparts simply by their lack of income. Rather, they were, quote, people who lack education and skill, who have bad health, poor housing, low levels of aspiration, and high levels of mental distress. Each disability is the more intense because it exists within a web of disabilities. And if one problem is solved and the others are left constant, there is little gain. Poverty would thus not be solved automatically by the expansion of the economy, and this was a time of economic expansion, as in a rising tide lifts all boats, the belief of many liberals in the early 60s. And it certainly would not be ended by exhortations to the poor to lift themselves up by their own bootstraps, the remedy that appealed to conservatives. Society, Harrington concluded, must help them before they can help themselves. America needed to undertake a broad program of remedial action on behalf of the other America, a comprehensive assault on poverty. In the introduction to the other America, Harrington wrote that the poor needed an American Dickens to make them visible to better off citizens, although quickly hastening to add that he was no Charles Dickens himself. There is, however, significant evidence of literary craft in the book, notwithstanding the informal and almost conversational tone that Harrington adopted in his prose. His creative achievement involved not only the sympathetic description of the lives and problems of the poor, but the creation of his own authorial persona. The voice Harrington adopted throughout the other America, and it was indeed characteristic of all the books to follow, 16 in total, uh, was calm and reasonable but also idealistic and impassioned. Unlike many left-wing pamphleteers, he had the ability to convey moral seriousness without lapsing into moralism. There's no hint in his writing of the sanctimonious bullying of the better off that pervaded so much of the radical style to come later in the 1960s. His tone suggested that the reader was a reasonable person, just like the author, and reasonable people, once apprised of the plight of the other America,
would agree on the need to find solutions. The enemies he identified in the book tended to be distant abstractions like social blindness or the vocabulary of not caring rather than identifiable individuals or political groups. Harrington often illustrated points with his favorite literary device, the use of paradox. The, quote, welfare state benefits those least who need help most, he wrote, because Social Security pensions and unemployment benefits were more likely to be available and more generous to those with good and steady employment. Poverty was, quote, expensive to maintain because poor communities required extensive public spending on fire, police, and health services. Harrington did not imagine the poor as finer or more authentic or more generous human beings than their better off brethren, as beat novelist Jack Kerouac had recently done in On the Road, or as John Steinbeck had done a generation earlier in The Grapes of Wrath. The lives of the poor, as portrayed in The Other America, were generally nasty, brutish, and short, precisely because they lacked such amenities of middle class life as decent housing, education, nutrition, and medical care. The Other America popularized the phrase culture of poverty, which went on to shape the main thrust of President Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. But a close reading of Harrington's book reveals an ambiguity in his employment of that term. Throughout the book, he used the term culture of poverty interchangeably with another term, vicious circle, which had been a staple of reformist literature since the progressive era. Here is one of the most familiar forms of the vicious circle of poverty. Harrington wrote in a typical passage. The poor get sick more than anyone else in the society. That is because they live in slums jammed together under unhygienic conditions. They have inadequate diets and cannot get decent medical care. When they become sick, they are sick longer than anyone else um, uh, because they are sick more often and longer than anyone else. They lose wages and work and find it difficult to hold a steady job. And because of this, they cannot pay for good housing, for a nutritious diet, for doctors. At any given point in this circle, particularly when there's a major illness, their prospect is to move to an even lower level and to begin the cycle round and round toward even more suffering. Harrington sought to convince his readers that poverty was a condition not easy to shed. Everything in the lives of the other Americans conspired to keep them in poverty. Outside intervention by the federal government was thus necessary to improve their condition. But nothing in the vicious circle he sketched uh, above was culturally determined in the sense that anthropologist Oscar Lewis had meant when he talked of the culture of poverty as a normative system at odds with the values of the larger society, an ingrained and unchanging way of life passed down from generation to generation. No part of the vicious circle Harrington described was related to a low level of aspiration or a tendency to indulge in immediate gratification or a propensity for violence or sexual promiscuity. Poor nutrition, poor medical care, poor housing, and the resultant frequent and lengthy illnesses were a result of lack of income, not of cultural traits or behaviors. Everything that Harrington described in this particular example of the vicious circle could be improved through the simple expedient of additional household income. Harrington had initially been drawn to the concept of the culture of poverty because he thought it would serve as a prod to federal action on many fronts, providing the poor with better housing, better medical care, better education, as well as job creation, which was his uh, preferred policy option. What he did not anticipate was that the theory could cut in other ways, antithetical to his own values and policy preferences. In the 1970s, the neoconservatives, which actually is a term that Harrington coined in 1973 to describe former liberals who had grown disillusioned or disaffected with government social welfare programs, uh, neoconservatives would use the notion of the culture of poverty to argue for abandoning the federal war on poverty. Harrington had argued that structural barriers to social mobility helped create and perpetuate a set of symptoms low aspirations, petty criminality, and the like. There's a connection between economic structure and culture uh, that distinguish those in the cu culture of poverty from the mainstream. Neoconservatives, in contrast, described such attitudes and behaviors, the culture, as the operative causes of poverty. And federal social welfare programs, they argued, were actually counterproductive, encouraging the spread of single parent families and the general culture of dependency. 
That argument, much more than Harrington's, would determine the fate of social welfare policy in the United States in the decades that followed. For President Ronald Reagan, it was axiomatic that, quote, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. Reagan was a conservative Republican who would consistently oppose social welfare spending since emerging as a political contender in the mid-1960s. There were those, including Michael Harrington, who hotly contested such views during Reagan's administration. His book, The New American Poverty, published in 1984, that is uh, Harrington's book, uh, challenged those who blamed the poor for their own condition and argued for a resumption of bold anti-poverty initiatives. But when Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton ran for office in 1992, pledging to end welfare as we know it, and later proclaimed that the era of big government is over, it was clear who had won the political argument on the merits and liabilities of social welfare spending. The poor never returned to the invisibility that had been their fate in the 1950s before the publication of The Other America, but concern over their condition never returned to the list of national priorities, not even in the years of democratic political ascendancy. How relevant does The Other America remain today as the poverty level creeps back up from its low point in the late 1960s and early 1970s? As social theory, the book shows both the signs of age and the imperfections of one of its central concepts. Harrington's culture of poverty thesis was at best ambiguous, at worst an impediment to making the case for what he regarded as the real solution to poverty, federal spending on jobs programs. In later books, he never made use of that term again. But what remains vital in the other America these many years later is its moral clarity. In the final chapter of the book, Harrington asked his reader to make use of their vision and to do so in two senses. First, he asked them to, quote, see through the wall of affluence and recognize the true dimensions of poverty in the United States and its cost and human dignity. Second, he declared that his readers needed to deploy their vision, quote, in the sense of purpose and aspiration. Harrington summoned his readers to war on poverty, not just for the sake of the poor, but for their own sakes. Americans, he felt, should be unwilling to live in a society that having the resources to provide everyone a decent standard of living was instead increasingly divided into two nations. The fate of the poor, he concluded, hangs upon the decision of the better off. If this anger and shame are not forthcoming, someone can write a book about the other America a generation from now, and it will be the same or worse. I thank you for your attention, and I welcome comments and questions. Could you uh, comment on the apparent lack of compassion of our culture relative to those of other uh, wealthy and developed countries? America is a conservative country. Uh, it's only in times of social emergency in the past that a, a rudimentary social welfare state was uh, constructed. Uh, or in times uh, of a great deal of social confidence that things are going to get better and so the pie is going to expand uh, and therefore we can cut off a slightly bigger piece for uh, the poor. Uh, America has a, a deeply entrenched um, individualist political, I'm sorry, deeply entrenched individualist political culture uh, reinforced by, of course, the disillusioning experience of the 1960s and 1970s. Americans grew disenchanted with big government, uh, not simply because the government was throwing money to solve problems, as Richard Nixon said, and that never worked, uh, but because of a lot of things Richard Nixon did, for example, uh, and his predecessors in Vietnam and Nixon and Watergate. Uh, so the kind of collapse in the belief in the, the virtues of government in the early 1970s was a complicated process that uh, Republicans as well as Democrats contributed to. But the result was that the Democrats as the party of big government and also the party that to the extent that America developed a social welfare uh, state uh, supported the, the, those measures, that, that disillusionment um, lent credibility to, to Ronald Reagan when he said government is not the solution to our problems, it's, it's, it's the cause of our problems. Um, and that uh, exacerbated, of course, by 30 years of, of sliding uh, uh, economic well-being for uh, 
large number of Americans, really a majority of Americans, who have to work harder uh, and longer uh, and uh, feel that they, they can't guarantee the children, their children, uh, as good a lives as, as, as they had. Uh, so for, for all of those reasons, uh, somehow the poor, once they got shoved off of the national agenda in the uh, early 1970s, never reemerged as a concern. At the same time, the poor remain very visible to us in some ways, much more visible than uh, when Harrington was writing in the last census report, 2010 census report, uh, showed that the absolute number of poor people today in America, uh, 46 million, uh, is roughly the same as it was when, when Harrington wrote The Other America. The proportion is smaller, it's 14% compared to 21% back in the 19, early 1960s, uh, but when Harrington said someone can write a book about the other America a generation from now and it'll be the same or, or worse, uh, that, that's a kind of startling confirmation of his observation. Sorry, long answer to a short question. But I'm Nancy Goldner from Boston Democratic Socialists. I want to ask you to comment on how uh, Michael Harrington's work on poverty links to his becoming a socialist and his understanding in a broader sense of what brings about poverty in a capitalist economy. Right. Well, I mean, he, his links with poverty began with the voluntary poverty uh, that he embraced uh, as a member of the Catholic worker movement and uh, where, you know, as he, he writes in his memoir, um, they lived with the poor on the Lower East Side in, in the St. Joseph House of Hospitality on Christie Street. Uh, they took their, their clothing, such as it was, off the, the pile of donated clothing for the poor. They ate with the poor. Uh, he, uh, his, his sense of identity with the poor, at least a particular subset of the poor, certainly began in his Catholic uh, social activist stage. Now, the poor on the Lower East Side, the Bowery of uh, the early 1950s New York, were ma mainly uh, aging male alcoholics. But he, if he could make that connection, um, he could certainly make a connection with, with uh, the, the poor more generally. Um, and so, yes, his, his socialism um, was intimately tied up with his, uh, his identification with the poor. Um, and, and it was, uh, I mean, he called himself a Marxist. He was a Marxist. Uh, but uh, his impulse as a socialist, I think, was first and foremost an underlying a, a, a moral impulse. Uh, and he felt that socialism was the way to restore those bonds of community uh, that had frayed um, in modern society. Good question, thanks. I'm Roxanne Reddington Wild from Action for Boston Community Development. We're actually the Community Action Agency, Anti Poverty Agency for Boston, celebrating our 50th anniversary this I'm not year because it started with the war on poverty. All the community action agencies did. I've not read the book yet. You've definitely convinced me to read the book. How much did Harrington address race, America's basically culturally ingrained in our system of race, and how much did he address racism as a driving factor in poverty for not all, but many of America's poor? Yeah, Mike was an advisor to Martin Luther King. He had worked with King starting in 1960. But uh, Martin Luther King's last um, campaign, as many of you will know, was a poor people's campaign uh, designed to um, increase pressure on Washington for uh, anti-poverty spending uh, and, and programs. And uh, uh, Mike was served as an advisor to the campaign. Of course, King was assassinated in April of 68 before the campaign took off. Uh, but King used to um, uh, joke with Harrington that, Mike, we didn't even know we were poor until we read your book. Um, th there's a lot about um, minorities, uh, uh, blacks and uh, uh, Hispanics, uh, particularly Hispanic farm workers in the other America. So he was very aware of that. And I think one of the things he expressed regret about is he had nothing about Native American poverty uh, in the book. Because the book is set up as a kind of a survey of different areas of poverty. Uh, from the Appalachians uh, to urban slums to uh, the, the uh, um, farming industry in California and so forth. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Tom Segrew from the University of Pennsylvania, um, and a long fan of uh, Morris and his wonderful biography, The Other American, which I commend to all of you to read. It's great. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in um, getting you to elaborate a little more on um, the connections between um, Harrington and um, Catholic social thought that you um, hinted at at the beginning in your examination of his Holy Cross transcript and then in the Q&A about uh, his time at the Catholic worker. Um, as I reread Other America um, just recently and, you know, in preparation for my presentation today, I, it, was, it struck me in some ways how Catholic um, it still is uh, uh, in, in 1962. Mm -hmm. And it's also striking, and I, I'm wondering if you can reflect on the connection between Harrington and um, two of the other really key players in the same debate that he's talking about, who are also Catholic but coming from somewhat different places, um, the relationship between Harrington and Daniel Patrick Moynihan and um, also Sergeant Shriver, because they're all basically right. at the same place at the same time in dialogue over culture, poverty, and, um, and the great society. Yeah, when he was a student at, even before at Holy Cross at St. Louis University High School, there was a, um, not a debate group, but a, a sort of discussion group called Sodality. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly, but you know, they would sit down and they would read these uh, papal encyclicals from the early 20th century in which the Pope is denouncing capitalism as a heartless system and you know, saying labor should get his due. Uh, and they were always having debates uh, you know, about um, social welfare policy or about uh, labor unions and um, of course being debate Mike would argue on one side or the other it didn't necessarily reflect his views but he took a lot from that and I, I think you're right that uh, in many ways the other America is is uh, as, as much a uh, Catholic as it is a socialist book in fact he doesn't use the word socialism in the book he said, later said that he felt a little guilty about that and used it uh, <laughs> repeatedly in all of his subsequent writings um, so Mike always identified himself as a cultural Catholic. Um, he said down at the end when he was dying of cancer, he wasn't going to negotiate with God at that point and re-enter the church. Uh, but, but that was a very formative uh, experience for him. Uh, and by the way, anybody interested in, in the, the, the period leading up to the writing of The Other America and the beginnings of the uh, collapse of industry uh, in Detroit and uh, um, and nationally should read Tom Segrew's uh, Origins of the Urban Crisis. I think I got that title right. Um, Dave O'Brien will be speaking later today, and he can be much more knowledgeable about Mike and Catholic uh, social teachings. Yes, Jules Bernstein. Uh, for, let me mention and, and talk about, uh, mention at least three, three books. First, I think it's important for this audience to know that Peter Edelman, uh, who was at the Georgetown Law School uh, and who left the Clinton administration over its welfare reform policies, has a new book coming out in May or June on poverty, uh, and the publisher will be the new press. Uh, and I, I, would like to think, I would like to think that uh, Peter's book will be the other America for the uh, 21st century. Uh, maybe I was a little too uh, optimistic. Uh, second uh, book, uh, you may have seen a piece by a fellow named McKinnon in the New York Times, an op-ed piece within the last two or three weeks. And this is a, a fellow uh, who, uh, frankly, was a Republican on Capitol Hill, uh, but who grew up in poverty and has written a book, I believe, called uh, Pitching Pennies in the Dark, in which he describes his life of uh, growing up in poverty, um, and who basically said in the Times op-ed piece, nobody wants to talk about this. Right. Democrats, Republicans, it's just a topic that uh, is uh, undiscussed. And I think that goes back to your and, and uh, the important point to me was here was a Republican. He'd, he'd worked on Capitol Hill for Republicans for a while. He's now in private practice, I believe, uh, <clears throat> that, that he was saying it. And of course, the last book uh, is Charles Murray. And I think that's the one that I'd like to get your take on, because here he says part of the problem is the indifference of the rich that the rich have become richer and richer and richer and more 
uh, and living in a bubble. And meanwhile, if you will, everyone else, particularly the poor and the white working class that he focuses on, has become demoralized uh, and uh, needs to somehow or other be rehabilitated in terms of values. Now, mm -hmm. our perspective is let's get some decent jobs out there and that will have a greater impact than all of the moralizing of, of Murray, but at least to have somebody on the other side talk about the divide and talk about the indifference of the rich and the 1%, I think is an important start. Right. Um, Peter Edelman, by the way, for those of you in Boston, will be speaking at the JFK Library on uh, Monday, June 4th at 5.30 to 7. I know because I'm going to be commenting on what he has to say, but um, uh, I urge you to, to uh, go to that if you're interested in following up on these issues. Um, I did see the McKinnon piece, and uh, yeah, it was a very compelling piece, especially given um, the source, and it is certainly true that um, um, while the Republicans have uh, Santorum or, Ging or Gingrich or the other one, uh, Romney, etch a sketch, uh, <laughs> said, I, you know, I don't care about the poor, the poor aren't of interest to me. Uh, but you will search uh, President Obama's speeches in vain uh, for uh, the words poor or poverty. It's just not an issue that he wants to address. Uh, politicians address the needs of the middle class, and as, as Tom said, you, you can get some political mileage out of scaring the middle class about their, their fall, potential fall into poverty. Uh, and in fact, one of the, the, the census data uh, released in uh, 2010, uh, one of the most compelling statistics, not just that there are 46 million uh, Americans who are at the, or below the poverty level, uh, but there, there are tens of millions of others who are uh, within a few thousand or ten thousand dollars of falling below themselves. So one uh, medical emergency or loss of a job uh, means that this, this huge pool of Americans uh, is either going to be in poverty or at least move through a period of poverty uh, in, in years to come. Um, the th Jules, your third. Uh, Murray. Murray. Oh, Murray. Um, Mike loathed Murray uh, and did quite a number on him in that book, New American Poverty, back in 1984. Murray's argument was, oh, uh, AFDC benefits have been going up, 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 so naturally uh, the welfare rolls uh, have been going up. It's a simple economic uh, relationship. It's mathematical. Uh, and uh, Mike said, well, that's curious because since 1973, uh, AFDC benefits have not been going up, they've been declining. So if this is a mathematical proposition, then welfare rolls should uh, decline as well. So for Murray to come around and get on the cultural bandwagon uh, is, is uh, interesting, because uh, Mike called Murray a vulgar Marxist, uh, assuming a one-on-one -on -one instant calculation on the part of every poor person about whether it was better for them to be in the workplace or, or be collecting uh, welfare uh, benefits. Um, I don't have any problem with M Murray saying that the rich have insulated themselves from the poor, and that's part of the problem, but he tends not to talk about the rich in the sense that you and I do, which is people with a lot of money, but it's people with a lot of cultural capital who you know, don't go to NASCAR and, and, and don't eat at Denny's and so forth, uh, and, and that they're somehow to blame for uh, poverty. Um, so, yeah, I, I would love to, one of the many occasions since 1989 that I thought, God, I wish Mike Harrington was here, was uh, when I saw Murray's book and thought, boy, could he do a number on this? Um, Michael Kays in Georgetown. I won't tell people to read your great book, America Divided. Yeah, you should. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could go into a little more detail, just as um, piggybacking off Tom Segrew's question, um, about the relationship between the other America and the anti-poverty program, which, which did get enacted as flawed as, as it was. Um, I believe, and this might be apocryphal, I, uh, that that Sergeant Shriver, you know, was not burning to head <laughs> the anti-poverty program, but that uh, Lyndon Johnson basically bullied him in, into doing it, announcing that he'd be head of OEO uh, after um, he, uh, Shriver was supposedly thinking about whether he wanted to be. Uh, but yeah. but beyond that, um, <clears throat> first of all, one um, clearly 
I think the anti-poverty program was not the kind of program that Michael would have wanted, even though he was also seen as the inspiration. Uh, first of all, what did he actually think of it uh, mm -hmm. at the time? And two, uh, why did it diverge so much from um, his, uh, his ideas? Well, um, and that's a very good question and a complicated one. Mike, of course, was invited down by Shriver to Washington, along with another person who'd written about poverty, Paul Jacobs, another radical. Uh, and that in itself is a me measure of the distance we've traveled between the early 1960s, a period of kind of social creativity in the present when two socialists could be invited down to consult on anti-poverty policy. You can imagine what you know, Glenn Beck or uh, Rush Limbaugh today would do, and uh, I'm, I'm sure there would be a much more careful vetting of any potential uh, consultant before they were invited to come express their opinions. And they had no institutional presence. They simply went down and talked with the uh, administrators who were devising the um, poverty program, and they said, jobs. That's what we need. We need jobs. And they were supported, interestingly, by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, then at the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, and he said jobs. But what Lyndon Johnson had said um, to uh, Sergeant Shriver, among other things, was basically no jobs programs. Jobs programs are expensive. In 1935, the uh, New Deal Work Progress Administration, WPA, the Public Works uh, Program, uh, received an appropriation of $5 billion, uh, which uh, in 1964 money would be $10 billion. And the first uh, year's budget for OEO, Office of Economic Opportunity, the anti-poverty uh, program uh, was $1 billion, so one-tenth what uh, had been spent on creating uh, jobs uh, for un the unemployed in, the, in uh, the New Deal. One of the appeals of the culture of poverty argument was since it focused on the behavior of the poor and teaching them better behaviors, uh, was that the programs needed to do that weren't all that expensive. Uh, they were well, some of them were actually quite successful programs, like, like Head Start. Uh, but the idea was, um, Shriver said, uh, a hand up, not a hand out. Now, why a jobs program would be a hand out is a good question. Uh, but that was, uh, I, I think, one of the unfortunate legacies of the popularity of the um, culture of poverty argument was that it gave public policy a particular uh, focus. So Harrington, you know, he didn't become a public critic of the war on poverty. He was glad to see some steps being taken, but it wasn't the war on poverty that he would have devised. Hi, uh, Peter Bruce. I used to be a DSOC member a long time ago, and uh, when you were arguing about him uh, dropping the uh, culture of poverty argument, I wondered, uh, when you explain why uh, poverty isn't on the agenda today, the, the U.S. Is a, has a conservative political culture and that sort of thing, I wonder if he himself would actually uh, express things in terms of political culture, uh, especially when uh, political culture itself seems to be mediated so much by institutions. If yeah. you look at the 99% movement and how uh, much anger there is at the banks and how much sentiment there is for uh, taxing the rich or maybe reenacting Glass-Steagall and things like that. Uh, right. uh, it seems like institutions play a really big role in uh, often pre preventing what the public wants from becoming public policy. Uh, look at Jacob Hacker and uh, Paul Pearson's book, uh, Winner Take All Politics and things like that. I think right. they do a pretty good job of showing that uh, really people do want policies that are a lot more liberal than what they're getting. and. Uh, uh, bring it back to Harrington and history a little bit, if you look at the history of the progressive agenda in the 70s, uh, pushing for a, a strong Humphrey Hawkins Act, but right. then being frustrated with uh, uh, the many conventions eventually being ended and Charles Manat uh, kind of right. imposing a strong hand and not really letting the, the agenda percol up, percolate up through the Democratic Party. Uh, I kind of wonder how, if he were alive these days, how would he think about institutions and their relationship to political culture? Yeah, really good question. Um, of course, you know, when Mike was writing uh, The Other America, the labor movement represented something over 30% of uh, all non-agricultural workers in the United States. And, and he took that as a given. He was very much, I mean, he was a child during the New Deal, but he was very much a political creation of the New Deal era. And, and the, the belief in 
the, the virtue of strong government, which was almost universally shared in the uh, New Deal and World War II and early Cold War years, uh, because it was delivering results, because people's lives were getting better, uh, the, the belief that there would always be a powerful labor movement um, fundamentally shaped Mike's politics. Uh, and, and so he could, um, he could I, in a way, he could be a little sloppy. Uh, he, could, he could pick up a concept like the culture of poverty, uh, not really think it through, not really think if it was describing what his ideas were about poverty, which were much more about economic structure than about culture. Uh, and it didn't seem like it would make a difference because what he needed to do was to get the poor out there in the public eye. Uh, and if the culture of poverty helped him do that, uh, that, that, that's, that was great. He didn't foresee a time when um, that belief in a strong uh, federal government and, and, and the virtues of that uh, would be eroded. He didn't see a t foresee a time uh, when the institutional power of organized labor, uh, both as a force in the workplace and a force within the councils of the Democratic Party, uh, would become so attenuated. Uh, and so, you know, from time to time, people say, well, what would Michael Harrington say today about this, that, or the other? And, you know, the, the real answer to that is, how the heck should I know? Uh, but if I were to channel him, uh, I, I would think that he would he would be really rethinking those assumptions that he inherited from his, his New Deal era childhood. Yeah, I mean, when uh, you look at the decline a, of the political labor movement. synthesis, which I can't outline. Yeah, when, when you look at the decline of the labor movement, it seems like uh, institutional factors are really critical, like the uh, lack of labor law reform, the impunity with uh, which employers can just fire people and demote them and things like that, uh, with no effect of labor law reform, uh, which has always been blocked by the filibuster uh, lately by Republicans, but before that by Republicans and Southern Democrats. And it just seems like uh, that kind of institutional weakness, plus business just being able to, to flee abroad whenever they can well, get Well, yeah, so wages, there's a so. political component and there's certainly an economic component in the globalization of manufacturing. Uh, we, we weren't uh, too, importing too our, that way. our electronic <laughs> junk from China in those days. We were building our, that electronic junk ourselves. Yeah. But, um, but I think, uh, you know, if, if we're going to rebuild some kind of a stronger progressive movement, we've got to be thinking a lot about labor law reform and uh, keeping business in this country. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex Laffey, Holy Cross. Um, I may be totally wrong, um, but I read The Other America when I was 17, and I haven't read it since. Uh, but I remember it. But what I remember in reading it as a 17-year-old, and, and he may not even have said this, this may be my imagination, um, but um, I have the impression that I have David, David Eisenhower building um, highways uh, that went out to the suburbs, and, um, and therefore you didn't ride through and see the poor. And so this was kind of the image that I had, and I've, oh, I've never forgotten that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it relates to the question of compassion, that I'm not, not sure, and I'd like you to comment on this, I'm not sure that the poor aren't just as invisible today as they were during Michael Harrington's time, in spite of all the programs, in spite of all the kind of structural and abstract and kind of uh, addresses, but... but um, but I think his genius, at least, you know, um, that that may have come, and I say this romantically, out of the Catholic worker mm -hmm. when he met the poor uh, in those drunken old men, um, was that arousal of compassion. And somehow that, I, 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 that seems to be uh, part of what is missing in, in the poor being uh, hidden today. I, I don't know. I, like no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and that passage, I remember that passage. Uh, it's about uh, the interstates al allowing people just to come in and out of the city quickly, or he was talking about commuters coming, he was thinking of New York City, commuters coming in from the suburbs from Connecticut and uh, going by the 125th Street stop, but you know, never, never looking down in the streets below. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I, I said, uh, I think that what remains valid in the other America is that, that uh, strain of, of um, 
morality, not moralism, not condemning others, but morality. And, and also the, the um, reflective of the time in which it was written, uh, the belief that a book could make a difference. Think about all the other big books in that period that actually sparked significant movements. Uh, Jane Jacobs' uh, Death and Life, of, I'm not getting the title right, but uh, Urban America, uh, sparking a movement uh, against urban renewal, slum clearance, and so forth. Um, the uh, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's book, came out the same year as the other America, sparking an environmental movement. Betty Friedan's the Feminist Mystique, coming out in 1963. Um, Ralph Nader's uh, uh, book about uh, consumer rights, uh, unsafe at any speed, uh, safety, consumer safety issues, uh, also sparking uh, a movement. So um, Harrington uh, had a faith in um, a moral appeal uh, reasonably presented. Uh, and that's something that, unfortunately, in today in our politics, I think it's, it's hard to sustain that faith. Um, you know, I think it was a better world in which Harrington was writing. Even though poverty was extensive, uh, it seemed like it was a problem that could be licked, just as America had licked uh, the, the Great Depression and had licked the Nazis in World War II and had built, you know, the greatest public works uh, project of all time, not something launched by Franklin Roosevelt, but by uh, Dwight Eisenhower and the interstate highway system, uh, that this, and this was something we could do. And again, I think that, that, that faith and belief has eroded considerably since then. Annette LaRoe, University of Pennsylvania. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, Michael Harrington's family of origin. Sure. He, ha he grew up in a very small family for that historical period. And I was wondering about his, um, his parents and his child rearing. Did he see much of his grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and their economic standing? And yeah. also how his parents felt about his career choice as well as his movement away from faith. His grandfather, Patrick, uh, was an Irish immigrant, came to St. Louis in the 1870s, was a saloon keeper, uh, and uh, something that his mother, who was very proper, uh, was never quite comfortable in remembering, but she was a formidable uh, woman. Uh, in, in, I think it's the, the pre preface to the other America, I think I have this right, uh, that he described his, he, he praised his father from whom he learned gentleness, and he praised his mother from whom he learned idealism, uh, which you know, is, is a sort of reversal of what you might expect, uh, in, in a sense. His, his mother was a very dominant figure in the family. Uh, she had been a school teacher. She had to stop teaching because uh, in Missouri in those days, in the 1930s, uh, married women uh, weren't allowed to take jobs as, as public school teachers. Uh, so she went back and got a, a graduate degree in economics and became, a, I think, an educational administrator. Um, she was a, an unusual woman for that era. And of course, as a Catholic woman with only one child, you have to ask yourself, how is that possible? Um, and maybe that condemnation of birth control, and the, we could sort of dig into that. Uh, so uh, his, his, his parents were very formative. He had an uncle, Dave, who was a, a city judge in St. Louis, uh, famous for his uh, compassion for the defendants who came before him, uh, especially if they were poor people who somehow gotten into uh, trouble, and he was known on occasion to pay the bail of people who'd come before him. So there too, uh, there was that sense of community and being uh, part of a, uh, uh, a community based on, on uh, religious principle. The Catholic Church in St. Louis uh, actually launched um, a desegregation uh, effort in 1946, really early. I mean, St. Louis was a southern city, uh, but the uh, parochial schools were uh, desegregated, and uh, I've wondered whether that might have had some impact on him. In some of his uh, writings uh, for the Holy Cross uh, literary magazine, he imagined uh, such things as race riots uh, and uh, blacks being lynched and, uh, you know, it's white boy from the, basically the, the, what at that time the suburbs of St. Louis grew up surrounded by uh, other white Catholics and was educated with other white Catholics. Uh, 
uh, but he was already attuned to that. In his salutatarian address, he made reference to um, the uh, racial problems we have to solve. Uh, we can build an atomic bomb, but you know we, we have these problems at home, some, some kind of image like that. Uh, so um, that, that his family, his extended family, uh, the extended Irish Catholic community and the, and the church in St. Louis were, were um, really significant in, in his development. And how did his parents feel about when he moved away in, in terms of his faith? Well, um, his father was a lawyer. They were delighted when he went to Yale Law School. He made law review. They were not so delighted when he said, no, I really want to pursue literary studies, although they supported him in Chicago uh, for a year and then not so delighted again. I mean, he was, this, this small, tight family was something that I think was very formative for him, probably something he was rebelling against. While he was at Holy Cross his senior year, he dated a woman from Wellesley College who was a Protestant and uh, she uh, later described the meeting um, the Harrington Sr. Uh, who were polite, but clearly not really happy with Michael's Protestant girlfriend. Uh, so he was, he was, you know, he had this rebellious streak. He always had a bohemian streak, uh, the, the way he dressed, even with the Holy Cross dress code. You know, he would pick up a crumpled jacket and sort of tie his uh, tie around his neck hastily and uh, you know never never very well shaved or uh, never a very close haircut uh, so um, they, he was going in a couple directions at the same time hi hi Matan Benishai from Brandeis um, so I know you talked about how Michael Harrington's uh, experience learning about poverty um, had to do with uh, interaction with homeless people. And, um, but when he wrote the book, the great crisis of homelessness had not really, uh, was not really yet on the radar. And I wonder how he would, um, in terms of the, the sort of structural uh, reasons, in terms of the, the sort of um, idea that these people are, are different from us, mm -hmm. um, in terms of, ideas of culture of poverty, um, how he would think about that uh, today when, you know, we have on the one hand um, a lot of issues where we think that what homeless people need is um, treatment for addiction and mental health. Right. And on the other hand, you know, you could argue that what the homeless really need is homes. It's homes, right. Uh, well, homelessness had certainly emerged as an, you're right, uh, in, in the early 1960s, uh, it, it was not a big issue, and you didn't see a lot of homeless except in places like the Bowery. Uh, by the 1970s, and Mike was living in New York, uh, the homeless were everywhere, partially had something to do with the deinstitutionalization of, of uh, mental uh, hospital patients in that period, but also uh, closing down of uh, cheap housing, and um, welfare hotels, and, and the like. So people were be beginning to be forced out on the street. By the early 1980s, there was, the newspapers were full of stories of people living in their cars. So Mike was aware of this new problem. I don't remember, uh, I, I think you're probably right. He, uh, he, what he would have advocated was public housing or, or Section 9 certificates or you know, other measures to, to deal with the homeless crisis rather than focusing uh, exclusively on or primarily on issues of behavior. Um, it, I'm sure he wrote about it in his 1984 book, The New American Poverty, which would be a source to go to. Hi, I'm, I'm Dan Geary. I actually teach at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, although I've not oh. come all that way today. Uh, I was struck when you were answering another question that you mentioned these uh, Other America is part of a series of books in the, in the early 1960s that shape public consciousness that shaped political policy as well. And it's hard to imagine that in 2062, you know, some, there'll, there'll, there'll be a book that will mark the 50th anniversary uh, of a book that was written in 2012. Um, so what does it say about this moment in 1962, you know, looking at the other America, that a book could have such an important impact and that today it's hard to imagine a similar kind of impact coming from the publication of a book 
Yeah. Um, well, there was a new constituency in the Democratic Party. Now, the, the Democratic Party was going in several different directions at the same time. The old Democratic Party based on ward organizers in the big cities and getting out the immigrant vote, and, you know, giving a turkey at Christmas, that, that had pretty much disappeared at, outside of a few areas by the early 1960s. And what increasingly was taking its place were young, well-educated uh, activists concerned with uh, the particular single issues in many cases, uh, urban renewal or the environment. Uh, and uh, that was a constituency that Harrington was very alert to. Of course, he came out of an educated background. Uh, he could talk that talk. Uh, but his goal uh, was to create a coalition, what he called a conscience coalition. Uh, between those newer forces within the Democratic Party, uh, younger, better educated, uh, professional, and, and the traditional uh, power of the labor movement, as well as social movements like the civil rights movement. He thought if you brought all those together, uh, you would have a uh, majority uh, coalition. And so, um, you know, Harrington certainly understood the, the, the power of um, of the reasoned argument to uh, build support for uh, that kind of politics among the, that sometimes called the new class. Harrington was also always uh, very attuned to young people. Uh, I mean, as you saw from the overview of his life, he was always the youngest in everything he did, uh, starting in kindergarten and then you know, through his college graduation. Uh, and he joined the Young People's Socialist League in the early 1950s, and he was still in it in 1960 when he was uh, 32 years old. He used to describe himself as the oldest young socialist in America. Um, and through the 60s, and of course, this is a whole other complicated history, but he was uh, very aware of and, and very open to uh, the new currents of radicalism on American campuses, uh, which for this, that, and the other historical reason, uh, was not a role he was able to play. He was not, he sort of blew his opportunity to be a mentor to that new uh, generation of radicals. And, and they were moving in other directions anyway, not so sympathetic to his politics. But um, I don't know how to come full circle back on this. Harrington was a believer in, in the persuasive power uh, of the essay, of, oops, of, the, uh, of the, the book. Uh, and you're right, it's hard to say what book published in 2012, well, the year's young. Uh, maybe Peter Edelman's book will be the one we'll be meeting back here in 50 years' time to, to celebrate, hopefully so. I won't be here, but <laughs> some of you can come. I'm Mary Hobgood from Holy Cross. I'd like to get back to the discussion between culture and economic structure. And you mentioned that Harrington identified as a Marxist. Mm -hmm. Did he ever explore why these jobs would not be forthcoming? We know that there was a radical restructuring of the U.S. labor market beginning in the, in the 1970s when the way to make profits for investors was to um, downsize and outsource and mechanize work, and there was a proliferation of low-wage service sector jobs increasingly defining the labor market. So my question is, uh, yes, he, you know, he advocated for jobs. That's as far as we've gotten in the discussion right now. But did he ever explore why these upper income jobs <clears throat> would not be forthcoming? Right. Uh, he, he certainly wrote about industrial policy. And he looked at Western Europe uh, as a model for um, uh, state involvement in creating and protecting jobs, not that he was a protectionist, but uh, he certainly s believed that uh, an active government could develop new kinds of industry. On the other hand, again, he, you know, he was a man of, of his era. Uh, his favorite union was the United Auto Workers, well, and the machinists. I mean, two big industrial unions based on traditional manufacturing. Uh, and, and, and that's how he thought in economic terms. Uh, and uh, I don't think he had the solution to, to that problem of globalization. Um, he was certainly also in favor of uh, international solidarity and international uh, agreements to protect labor standards abroad, and he would have seen that as, as one way to make sure that uh, 
you know, people aren't being paid 17 cents an hour to assemble uh, iPods in, in China, not that he knew about the iPod. Um, so I don't have a very good answer to that question, but it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.